is the story of the crime that helped define the 60s. When in so many regards, one thinks jolly good luck. It shakes things up and embarrasses a complacent establishment. It's one of those watershed moments, that kind of hinge moment, if you like, where the momentum of life just shifts. It's pulled off by modern-day highwaymen, the type who appeal to the British, to be seen here in archive interview. They saw them as roguish and uh, cocking a snoot at society. One of them even managed to stay on the run for three decades. It made him into a different person. He became somebody I didn't know or like. Behind the myths of Daring Do is a darker tale, a tarnished dream, and dozens of lives wrecked. I know it was wrong of him to do that, but at the end of the day, he was my father and, I, you know, I loved him. It is one of the most controversial media stories of its age. On the one hand, a robbery that draws admiration for its daring bravado. On the other hand, a violent, thuggish act of greed. So what really happened? On the night of Thursday, 8th of August, 1963, a train is on its way from Glasgow to London. Along the way, it's collecting huge amounts of cash. At the same time, a gang of thieves leave a remote farmhouse in Buckinghamshire. When the figure of one million to six million was mentioned to me, um, my first thoughts were, well, this is it, this really is El Dorado. The plan is to stop the train and rob it. Each man knows what he has to do. It's 3 a.m. in the middle of nowhere. They hotwire the red signal and cover up the green with a glove. It was cheeky, it was audacious, it was extremely well executed. The raid is planned with military precision. I saw myself as, a, you know, an extension of a commando leader. Growing up in the war, seeing all the aeroplanes bombing and dogfights and stuff and reading the comic books, it was a boy's own adventure. So who are these adventurers lying in wait for an oncoming train in the middle of the night? a team of South London thieves could pull off something like that. The train robbers gang comes from all over London's southern suburbs. It's been put together by two men, Gordon Goody from Putney and Bruce Reynolds from Battersea. Crime was my life. I mean, uh, the, the excitement was there. That was, I think, more predominant than, than the money. Bruce Reynolds deals in bric-a-brac, but is fond of the high life. He got his shoes made the same place where the Queen gets her shoes made. He used to drink wine when, uh, A, you could hardly get wine in England. It was seen as a bit of a suspect drink that only girls have. Gordon Goody is a hairdresser. My father wanted me to be um, a plumber. If I'd listened to him, maybe I'd have been better off. But uh, I didn't become a plumber. I wanted to be a thief. Goody and Reynolds have with them on the track that night a gang of talented accomplices that they met in prison and on the streets of South London. They cut the communication wires so no one can call for help and then wait for the train to arrive. Buster Edwards is a florist. Charlie Wilson, a greengrocer, who will later be sprung from prison. 
as will Ronnie Biggs, a builder. Well, I'd extracted a promise from him when he married me that he would never um, engage in any criminal activity ever again. And he gave me his word and I believed him. And I think he meant it at the time. Tommy Wisby, a newcomer, is a bookie from Camberwell. I was the, the only black sheep of the, our family. It was all, they was all hard-working people. For the dozen or so men on the track, this is the most exciting moment of their lives. There are a generation of working-class men who were born at the beginning of the 1930s who are too young to have fought in the war. So they haven't had the experience of adventure that comes with the war, but also that, crucially, I think they haven't had the experience of national solidarity. So they don't perhaps have the stake. They don't have the loyalty. This is the way I looked at it. I was an outlaw, that society didn't care for me, and I didn't particularly care for society. The train that is making its way closer and closer to Reynolds and his gang is a mail train. The general post office, the mail, um, which had the symbol of the Queen's head on it. If they went for a target like that, then they played for very high stakes. This will be the first time in 125 years that anyone has robbed a travelling post office. The thieves have worked out that the high street banks are doing what every private citizen has been told never to do. Sending cash through the post. And they're doing this pretty well every night, by the tonne load, in mail sacks. What, on a common sense level, seems total lunacy, i.e. transporting large sums of money through the night with no guards, for some reason in large institutions which have been going for a long time, people look at these things differently, they become a sort of traditional thing, so they become entrenched. They're virtually unprotected, and vast sums of money are being carried all over the country. Uh, their main security is the fact that nobody knows how much is on board. When it gets to Buckinghamshire, the mail train is ripe for the picking. It has picked up money in mail bags from stations all along the way. I'm old enough to remember seeing them hanging from baskets. The train didn't stop. It just careered through the station, and a net went out and picked the bag up. This is enough money to transform the robbers' lives. A bric-a-brac merchant, a hairdresser, a florist, a builder, a greengrocer, a bookie. South London thieves with day jobs and criminal records united by the same thing, aspiration. And in the 50s and 60s, you have the explosion of advertising and consumerism. Suddenly, there's a brave, bright new world out there which you can just about reach, but kind of can't. We'll get high, high. we touch it. We'll touch the sky, we the cheese there. There's now a culture of ambition, material ambition, aspiration. I want a television, a car, a holiday, a nice house. I want all those things and I'm going to go out and grab them. The robbers are family men with wives, kids and rent to pay. For a long time, I believed that he did it with a view to benefiting his family, uh, because that's what he said he had in mind. A better life, you know, to what my father had. You know, he was a hard worker, worked all his all his life. I couldn't see him getting any benefits, you know. What the hours he put into what he was doing, you know. He wanted that pot of gold, and that pot of gold he found. Before dawn. Bruce Reynolds spots the lights of the train approaching the stop signal. Well, I think I remember him saying he put his head down onto the railway tracks as he'd heard that's what Lawrence of Arabia did to hear when the trains were coming. It's the moment of truth. 
as the train stops as planned at the rigged signal. We still didn't know any amount of money we was getting. We couldn't say we were going to get 500,000, 800,000 or 200,000. There's no going back now. So far, the scheme has worked to perfection. But all that is about to change. People have this kind of Robin Hood fantasy, if you like, of the great train robbers as actually, you know, some sort of Ealing comedy enterprise, um, which, of course, it isn't. You know, these people are career criminals who are out, you know, to get what they can for themselves. The next 30 minutes will see a transformation. The ruffians will become thugs as an audacious robbery turns into a violent raid. In the early hours of Thursday, 8th of August, 1963, the Glasgow to London mail train comes across an unexpected red light at Sears Crossing, Buckinghamshire. Jack Mills, the driver, brings the train to a halt. He is 58, approaching retirement, and what happens next will change his life. When the train stopped, I was the first one onto the foot plate, and uh, Jack Mills was somebody trying to come up on the other side, and Frank, um, Jack Mills was trying to keep him down. Jack Mills puts up a brave fight to defend his train as more men swarm into the cab. About three or four people getting on one side and three or four people getting on the other side. Mills is hit on the head and collapses. Mills had a cut over his eye. He wasn't bad, bad. He was talking to us. He said, I think you're far a gentleman, he said, yeah. <laughs> Medical reports describe multiple injuries. A half-inch deep laceration, a quarter-inch cut in front of his right ear, and another deep cut on the back of his head. Mills will need 14 stitches and two days in hospital. There was a loose cannon there who uh, panicked and, and, and hit the guy. You see, adrenaline running through, you know, when you're on that sort of work, you know. The robbers have always said Mills was hit by accident, that they intended it to be a non-violent raid. It was a mistake that should never have happened. But what if intimidation is all part of the plan? Would, would they have gone even further? Would they have killed him on the spot? They may have done. Witnesses later claim that the robbers used more force than they have admitted. The Jack Mills assault was obviously a very critical part of the robbery, but it's been isolated as if it was the only, only bit of violence on the entire raid. They had got an assortment of, of felling axes, sledgehammers, crowbars, and they battered their way into the high-value coach. The high-value package compartment, the HVP, is where the money is held. They were hit with clubs and coshes. It's not an isolated thing that just only Jack Mills by accident just happened to get hit. They went in there and they were violent and they hit people. One of the crew describes the robbers as very aggressive, pushing the staff around, striking some of them. If it was going to be your brother on the train or your husband or a friend of yours and they were brutally attacked like that and terrified, would you think these guys were, were cool? Would you think they were heroes? I don't think you would. There, in front of the robbers, are mailbags stuffed full of banknotes. Ten shilling notes, one pound notes, fivers. They have hit the jackpot. That's when I found the first bag. What I saw was the first bag of, well, lots of bags in a cage. And I, I pulled one out and I opened, cut it open and, uh, I could see it was cash, and uh, that was it. That was the prize. Everyone I picked up was there, I thought, yeah, that, that, that's good. It's, 
it's the real thing, you know. I look back to someone, I forget it wasn't with, this is it, like, you know. If everyone's an adrenaline and is pumping away like mad, when the half an hour was up that I'd allotted for the unloading, I called it a day and I went in the lead Land Rover and we drove off into the night. The world wakes up to the news that an untold amount of money has been stolen from the Glasgow to Euston mail train. Driver had been coshed and handcuffed. John Woolley is then a 25-year-old Buckinghamshire policeman. These were the big boys in the criminal world. And, well, I suppose we... I suppose we held them in some degree of awe. The banks are trying to work out exactly how much money has gone. But there's a mixture of both uh, surplus notes going back to head office and notes going for destruction. It started off at two, three hundred thousand and then was spiked uh, every two hours up by another quarter of a million. And so we went up to a million, a million and a half, a million and three quarters, two million, two and a quarter million, two and a half million pounds. And that was a complete sensation. I know I was earning about 10 pounds a week. And it really was difficult to, to you know, just imagine how much. It was two and a half tons of money in weight. The mountain toll of money. The stories coming from the railway track. This is the best adventure story since the Dam Busters. The British public are in a frenzy. Fueled by the media who picked up on the train robbery, originally called the Cheddington Mail Van Raid, until some bright spark at the Daily Sketch said, let's call it the Great Train Robbery. The robbers themselves, perpetrators of this daring deed, haven't gone far. They're in hiding not back in South London or further afield. They have stayed in Buckinghamshire. And it was here to Leatherslade Farm that they returned with their loot and set up their hideout. They're in a local farmhouse, playing Monopoly with real money and waiting till the heat is off. Perfect. Oh. I suppose after a time, you know, we'd have I'd have decided what I wanted to do, you know, once all the hullabaloo had, had died down, you know. Four, five, six, seven, eight. They believe they're secure in their lair. They've laid in enough supplies for weeks. It was part of their plan that they had got probably no more than 30 minutes, half an hour, from leaving the scene of the crime to being undercover, off the road, safe from prying eyes. This is too big a job for the Bucks police to handle on their own. I was dealing with minor traffic accidents, minor theft, occasional bit of poaching. Time to bring in the cream of the Metropolitan Police Force. The Flying Squad, the Sweeney Todd that everybody knew about. These were the folk heroes of my generation of policemen. And yet now there they were, descending on the little village of Brill and on my police station. It's agreed the manhunt will be focused within 30 miles of the crime. Smart police work. Leverslade Farm, where the robbers are hiding, is precisely 27 miles from where the raid took place. That would flush them out. They'd get their panic. They might just suddenly decide, well, we've got to get out of here. We had a um, high-frequency radio listening to the police calls. Keep searching all isolated properties, but exercise extreme caution. These men are dangerous and will stop at nothing. If the robbers jump ship immediately, they risk being caught in a trap. But sooner or later, their hideout will be found. 
people in the countryside are, frankly, more nosy. If you want to hide, if you don't want to be seen, if you don't want to arouse attention, then you stay in the city. The idea that you can go down into the countryside and nobody's going to notice you is, is a, a townie's mistake and it costs them big time. Four days after the great train robbery, a small Buckinghamshire police station receives word of suspicious activity at a local farmhouse. It all started with a telephone call and my sergeant asked me, did I know where Leatherslade Farm was in Brill? We had a walk round the yard. In two separate garages were two Land Rovers. And it was then that I noticed that the registration number on those two Land Rovers was the same. Inside the house, there is a trap door in the kitchen. I could see that the cellar was absolutely chock-a-block with bulging sacks. And as the top flopped open, I could see parcel wrappers, banknote wrappers, consignment notes, all bearing the names of the famous high street banks. Tipped off by police radio traffic, the robbers have got out just in time. But they have abandoned the farm without covering their tracks. What really did go wrong was that the guy who was paid to basically go to back to the farm and burn it down did a runner. Once the farm is discovered, the full media circus rolls into town. The little village of Brill has never seen anything like it. Several sets of fingerprints have been discovered, and it's quite a good bet that some of those fingerprints will match records at the yard. In addition, of course, there are vast stocks of tinned food and other stores, and it's possible the police may have a lead here. We were filmed from every angle, sideways up in the sky with the helicopters. And people who probably had never had their views canvassed on, on anything of importance were suddenly being asked to comment. Which side are you on, the cops or the robber? The robber, because I think they were clever. But he's and, dishonest. Well... I still, I'm still on his side. What about you? Whose side are you on? Police. Why? Oh, a man did wrong and he should get his own punishment. Tommy Butler, chief of London's elite flying squad, is now in charge of the case. He would give the impression that, that he knows all about you, and maybe he didn't, but he'd give the impression that he did, and, and that that kind of, like, fitted this notion of this cunning old fox. Tom Button had a reputation, and um, he was a villain. He was... I see Tom Butler as... He was so streetwise, he thought like a thief. He thought like I did. <laughs> the robbers have been flushed out of their lair and scattered. But the flying squad already has intelligence on who they are. Well, no, the police could guess who did it, because there was only one gang in London who could have done it. They knew straight away, bloody Reynolds. That is, how did he do it? And how are we going to prove that he did it? Wanted notices are issued, with photographs. There was a sense from the time when police issued the wanted poster that they knew uh, exactly who they were looking for, and that around these figures, a net had been set up, which was gradually tightening. A lot of the information that was coming in wasn't supplied because people were looking for a reward. A lot of it is because they were jealous that they weren't on it. The envy of their peers, the front covers of the newspapers. The robbers are fast becoming celebrities. 
Wanted, Bruce Reynolds. Dresses smartly with good quality suits. A smooth talker, fond of dog tracks. Likes fast cars and spends freely. There was roadblocks, there was intense police activity. It then become like a gigantic manhunt. Eight days after the robbery, £30,000 is found in a caravan belonging to Jimmy White, one of the robbers. Another £100,000 is found in Redlands Wood, Dorking. The media almost portrayed it as like um, treasure hunt. Uh, where's the money? You know, could the money be here? And some money's been found in a phone box. It could be you that could find it next time. In London, the Wisbys are on a spending spree. One minute we would buy clothes from a catalogue, and the next minute we'd be in a black taxi down to Knightsbridge in Howard's. <laughs> but for Charmy and Biggs, Ron's homecoming can only mean trouble ahead. He tipped the contents of the kit bags onto the floor, and the notes were all done, done up in bundles. And they smelled horrible, very fusty. I was just anxious for him to get it out of the house as soon as possible. Forensics have spent 10 days dusting the farmhouse for prints and are now examining what they've found. The main evidence was, was the fingerprint evidence that was found on uh, artefacts at the farm. We had cats, he liked cats, and he put a saucer of milk out at Leatherslade Farm, and I think there was a fingerprint on that. It was on other things that he'd handled inside because he hadn't worn gloves all the time. Some of the others wore gloves from start to finish and never took them off. The flying squad combs London and the southeast. Criminals stay indoors. The streets are quieter than they have been in years. An unexpected bonus of the hunt for the train robbers. There were the arrests that, that followed quite quickly and those extraordinary images. People with blankets over their heads being taken in and out of court and handcuffed to policemen. A whole group of policemen, eight perhaps, arrived at the house and sort of, I answered the door, but they, they barged in. I explained to them that I was, they wanted to know where Ron was, he was at work. Um, I said I can call him, no, I wasn't allowed to use the phone. I was made to sit down and say nothing as they all stood around the room until Ron came home from work. Tommy Butler comes in person with his officers to Tommy Wisby's door. They asked me, you know, where I was and all that. I said, well, it's two months ago. I can't remember. I've, just, I've told you everything, so... She said, we don't f***ing believe it anyway. She said, you're nicked. Gerald Seymour reports on the arrests for ITN. That went on right the way through um, late summer, autumn, and into winter. And the final big one before Christmas uh, was the arrest of Roy James, who did a runner over the rooftops. They dragged him down, about 10 policemen dragged him down into the news. And I said to the detective, you know, who have you caught, who have you captured? And he said, oh, it's all right, we've got him. And we've just heard the news on the television set and the dominoes were going down faster than our lights and I thought well, it could be my turn. Bruce Reynolds will stay on the run for four years. Early one morning, the doorbell went. My dad shouted out, Nick, can you get that? I just ran down the stairs, opened the door, and the next thing I knew, I was the door came bursting open, I was pushed up against the wall. Police come charging in and basically threw themselves across the bed. Then my dad came in with Tommy Butler and basically just said to me, my son, you know, dad's been a very naughty boy and he's got to go to prison, son, and, you know, I love you, and that's it. I knew we were running from something, but I didn't know what. And it never occurred to me that my dad could have been a, a bad guy. So when the police came, I thought, hey, the running's over. They come to rescue my dad. We're safe now. 
he was quite sort of vuncular and said, well, I've got you at last, Bruce, and had just come out natural, I said, so love you, Tom. The police were particularly nice to me, and I, I couldn't understand. Uh, they were being very friendly and giving me presents and stuff like that, and whereas my mum was just an absolute mess, crying her eyes out. The trial of the great train robbers begins on 20th of January 1964 in Ellsbury, Buckinghamshire. Just at a moment when Britain is on the cusp of a new world. Within a year there will be a change of government. The old guard will be ousted and younger men will come to power. But for now, there is still a deep-rooted fear of anything that threatens the status quo. This was a society that had become, in many ways, kind of fossilised. You have an elite of people who are all drawn, by and large, from the same class. They've been to the same schools, they've been to the same country houses at weekends, they have the same kind of grouse moor uh, values and, and tastes and so on. It was almost a crime against the state, and they weren't going to put up with that. That was something that was attacking the establishment, atta attacking the very fabric of organised society. It was a real show trial. It was a real piece of theatre. So you had a sort of Nuremberg trial thing. It was a big occasion. The robbers will always complain that when their case comes to trial, the odds are stacked against them. They didn't have a hope in hell. The defence applied to have the trial at the Old Bailey because they thought that the, the, the jury in Buckinghamshire would be too partisan. The Crown appoints Justice Edmund Davis as judge. Bad news for the robbers. A very tough, hard, unemotional man. That was his reputation. And they would get no favours from him. It's the state versus the people. Law and order versus criminality. Time for the top brass to take on the folk heroes. It's the grey days of winter 1964, and the great train robbers are on trial in Buckinghamshire. This is the reality television of its day. The robbers and their families in the full glare of the media spotlight. Time for some 1960s power dressing. The robbers wags, as it were. They're kind of um, gangsters moles from central casting. And they sort of have this sort of ultra-fashionable early 60s look, the kind of beehive and the false eyelashes and the mini skirts and whatnot. smart women wearing clothes, costumes, that you didn't normally see in Aylesbury. With so much at stake, the robbers have secured the best barristers that money can buy. Uh, I, I suppose it came to about £30,000. Legal expenses and cost a fortune. I think my legal, expense, my, legal, um, my legal expenses for the train was something like thirty five grand. Cash. Because I want to get someone who I thought was reliable, you know? Tommy Wisby couldn't even afford to pay off the hire purchase on his car, which amounted to £30. How those people managed to hire top QCs of the day, some of them, like Biggs, managed to get poor person's relief, which then subsequently became um, legal aid. But many of them paid privately for their defence, and it, it was tens of thousands of pounds. Where did that money come from? Great train robbery. The strategy is to persuade the jury that the robbers weren't on the train and weren't in the farmhouse. It's my contention that all the fingerprint evidence that was placed there was placed there by policemen intent on embaying orders that these men must be caught. Gordon Goody tries to prove that the forensic evidence against him, paint from the farm on his shoe, was put there by the police. I was fitted up. I was a train robber. 
Well, no doubt about it, you know. I was fit enough. But did the police really fit the robbers up? Or is it something the robbers say to make themselves look better? Could the answer lie with the men who got away? Seen by witnesses on the track that night, but never brought to trial. The three men got away simply because there wasn't the evidence to prosecute them. Police did know who they were, but they couldn't bring them to justice. With no hard evidence against them, the police cannot say who they are. And the robbers, along with their families, refuse to name them. Yeah, that, that will never come from my lips. I'm sure it'll come out at some point, but um, that's not for me to say, I'm afraid. But are their names important? Some believe they only matter because if three men escape justice, the evidence against the others must be solid. If they were fitted up, why couldn't the police also fit up the three guys who got away? The answer is they weren't fitted up. Aside from the forensic evidence, the prosecution have a trump card. The violence used in the robbery specifically against train driver Jack Mills. The robber's family say his injuries are overstated. Year after year, it comes out, oh, the train driver was killed by the train robbers. He wasn't. He died of lymphatic leukaemia some years later. He got a good hiding, and if you speak to his family, they will tell you that he never properly recovered. I don't really think it makes any difference, you know, whether they killed him on the spot or he died later. They, they still whacked him in a very vicious way. He's a man who was, you know, approaching old age. I, to me, it was, a, it was a violent, unnecessary thing to do. After an eight-week trial, the jurors decide. It took the jury 52 and three-quarter hours to reach their verdict. It took them 10 minutes to deliver it this morning. Guilty. And not only that, in the judge's summing up, it is clear that he sees them as violent criminals. Let us clear out of the way any romantic notions of daredevilry. This is nothing less than a sordid crime of violence inspired by vast greed. The relatives were up in the public gallery. Uh, you, you could have heard a pin drop initially. Um, some of the one, one of the mothers of one of the prisoners screamed out. Leonard Field's mother, up in the public gallery, shouted as the judge was sentencing her son, he's innocent, my poor boy. And Field looked up at her and said, calm down, mum, I'm still young. The robbers are given more than 300 years between them, up to 30 years each, with, at the time, no parole system. Renee Wisby is at home with the children and another train robber's wife, Jill Hussey. She said they got 30. So my mum was overing. So my mum went, oh, that's all right, 30 months. So Jill went, no, not months, years, years. And then she went, crash, she, she fainted, my mum. There is a massive public outcry against the severity of the sentences. It is only when the parole board is introduced three years later that there is any hope of an early release. Don't know just what to do with myself. I'm so used to doing everything with you. Marilyn Wisby is nine, Nick Reynolds six, when their fathers are sent down. But the very first time I visited him in, in, in prison made the strongest uh, or the biggest lasting impression in my mind. Get to Durham, which was on a hill, and it'd be a blizzard, and we'd get there 10 minutes early. Endless passageways, the keys, the doors. So we finally, finally went round and round and round until we came to this little secure unit in the middle, and it was like he was in a, like a glass cube or something. And I was putting my nose and kissing him on the glass pane. I'd be in the car park after the visit, and he'd said, you know, if you looked up X windows up and everything past the barred windows, 
I'd see a little handkerchief waving and that would be him before he went into his cell. And uh, I always had a lump in my throat. Alongside the robbers in jail is one man who was arrested, tried, found guilty and sentenced with the rest of them. But Bill Bold, who leaves behind a wife and three kids, was not involved in the planning or execution of the crime. I'm afraid that he slipped out of the radar, um, and I do, to this day, think that was a miscarriage of justice. Well, as, the, as I'm the eldest, he expects me to look after um, Anthony and Deborah, of course. Uh, he puts me in charge of them to see they don't um, run, ar run around the streets too much. He, ex he expects me to give them some sort of tuition, the way he, he, g he gave me tuition. What sort of things do you teach them that he taught you? Well, just um, honesty, man. And he died in prison, the poor guy. He died in prison. It's a... Bad news. I feel very strongly about it, you know. At the trial, the robbers don't help Bold because of their own not guilty plea. It's very hard to discern between a group of professional criminals who have pleaded not guilty to discern that amongst them is somebody who's also pleaded not guilty but really is not guilty. But once in jail, there was no orchestrated campaign to get him out. Having been convicted and having got their sentences, actually any time after that, they could have got together and said, we're going to get this guy out because it's not fair that he's sent to prison. It's actually wrong. But they never did. The robbers have all since protested Bowles' innocence. But could more have been done at the time? They, they didn't bother with him because they didn't care. And if they say they do now, then I don't believe it. A year after the robbery, Charlie Wilson scales the walls of Winston Green Prison. He's found with his wife and children three years later. In July 1965, Ronnie Biggs escapes from Wandsworth Prison and flees the country. He'll remain on the run for 36 years, longer than his original sentence. I don't think I would ever entrust my well-being uh, to somebody else again after that. Um, I'd rather run my own show. I can rely on me. <laughs> Biggs's escapades revived the heroic myth of the robbers, even though he played only a very minor part in the raid. Sordid and crooked as they are, the great train robbers will always be remembered as the equivalent of 18th century highwaymen. And, you know, as many facts about the case can emerge as you want, but it'll never change the public perception. By 10 years after the robbery, most of the families had nothing to show for it. The, the money went on being on the run. It's an expensive game, laundering, false passports, keeping one step ahead of the law. I lost a lot of money, as it happens. I don't know other people, a lot of other people trusted their friends. And these are friends, and they f you for money. Who can they trust? Because if they steal the money off them, what are they going to do? They're going to go to the police? They can't. It got put into businesses where buying them and worked. The dream that glittered wasn't gold. I think you have to be educated to be able to have money. What's the point of having loads of money if you're not educated? You're not using it to your best ability. Not that clever. All you had to do was stop a train in the middle of the night on a track where there's no other trains running along and take the money away. It would have been cleverer if we'd all got away, maybe. What a waste. What an awful waste of some clever, bright guys who the fork in the road went left when maybe there was a right and paid so dearly for it. And um, I can't see that. 
I may be completely wrong. I can't see that any of them would have said, yeah, hey, it was worth, it was worth it. You can't always get what you want. You can't always get what you want. You can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, well, you might find. 